As I mentioned, today is a very special day for us here at Langley. In this, our centennial year, we have gathered to celebrate the opening of a powerful new computational facility that promises to accelerate our research for decades to come. But really, more importantly, we're here to honor the legacy of one of the most ad admired and inspirational people ever associated with NASA. And the person for whom this building is going to be named after, Katherine G. Johnson, the mathematician and human computer. Before we go any further, I also want to recognize the distinguished guest that we have participating in today's events. Please hold your applause till I get to the end of the list of names and recognizing them all. So, starting, join us today. The Honorable Terry McAuliffe, Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. The Honorable Mark Warner, United States Senator from Virginia. The Honorable Donnie Tuck, Mayor of Hampton. By way of video, we're here from the Honorable Scott Taylor, Congressman from Virginia's Second District. Also joining us here today are Colonel Jason Kelly of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. From NASA headquarters, Dan Tenney, the agency's acting associate administrator for mission support. And today's keynote speaker, Margot Lee Shetterly, author of the best-selling book, Hidden Figures, which serves as a basis, basis of the motion picture uh, hidden, uh, hidden Figures of the same name. Sorry. So let's give them all a very warm welcome. Thank you. We also have an amazingly diverse and distinguished group of other guests here today from so many different sectors. We have elected officials, government officials, community leaders, congressional staff members, representatives from industry and academia, as well as the families of other human computers, like Mary Jackson and the Dorothy Bond families. Thank all of you for being here today as well. Now, I've saved the best for last. She's a Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient, a member of NASA Langley's Hall of Honor, and just last month, she celebrated her 99th birthday. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in letting her know how much we appreciate her in being here in her service to the nation, Ms. Katherine G. Johnson. So in a few minutes, we'll officially open the Katherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility, or CRF as we call it, a building that sets the stage for our continuing digital transformation in an exciting new era of sophisticated modeling and simulation. We know that these are the tools that will help us shape the world of the future, just as Langley's wind tunnels have helped shape nearly every aircraft that's in the skies flying today. Thanks to this new building's robust, carefully designed infrastructure, we'll do more calculations than ever, and we'll do them faster, more efficiently, and with greater reliability. In a world facing increasingly complex challenges, Langley researchers will need access to more computational power. We will also need a solid foundation on which to create the computing capabilities of tomorrow. That's the promise of this new building holds. It allows us to better address the challenges of the future. So now let's take a quick look inside the facility that will drive so much of Langley's research in the years ahead. Hi, I'm Vince Whitfield and we're here at the Katherine Johnson Computational Research Facility at NASA's Langley Research Center. We're about to cut the ribbon on this state-of-the-art facility, but before we do, let's take a sneak peek inside the building that will enable innovative research and development across all of NASA's mission areas. Let's take a look inside. This building, the third new structure built in the last six years as part of the center's revitalization plan, is named for Katherine G. Johnson. For those watching who may not know, Ms. Johnson is a human computer. 
an amazing mathematician who calculated trajectories and played a key role in America's human spaceflight program, including the Apollo 11 moon landing. Featured in the lobby is a beautiful portrait of Ms. Johnson that was taken last year at nearby Fort Monroe by famous photographer Annie Leibowitz for a Vanity Fair magazine article. We also have items here that recognize Catherine and the other human computers, like an official proclamation from the Commonwealth of Virginia and a Group Achievement Award from the NASA Administrator. A little less than half of the space in this 37,000 square foot facility is dedicated to supporting the employees of the Office of the Chief Information Officer and those who will be contributing to and benefiting from the technologies that are housed here. Researchers from across the center will conduct a variety of computing projects here, including aerodynamic modeling, entry, descent and landing calculations, and computational fluid dynamics. The facility advances Langley's capabilities in modeling and simulation, big data, and analysis. Much of the work now performed in wind tunnels will one day be handled by powerful computers, such as those in the CRF. Now, let's go take a look at the guts of this high-tech facility. The data hall has a maximum capacity of nearly 200 racks. That's enough to store almost 4,000 systems here. You may have noticed the racks are mostly empty right now. About 1,200 servers will be moved from the current locations on center later this fall, allowing us to consolidate numerous server rooms and data centers from across Langley into this one data center here in the CRF. When all of the systems are moved, there will be about 13 miles of copper network cabling and 97 miles of fiber optic cable in the building. Now I know it's loud in these rooms and here's why. The electrical power plant that powers the IT functions of this building can supply 2.1 megawatts. That's enough to power a small town. Because of the importance of the information on the servers, the building is designed to withstand category three hurricane conditions. There are generators that can run continuously even in the event of a power outage and it's on track to receive LEED Silver Certification from the US Green Building Council. The building is an energy saver, 33% more efficient than energy standards just a few years ago. So that concludes our quick look at this new building, a building whose capabilities and people will help to address NASA's future challenges. Speaking of the future, we have a special treat from the next generation of NASA employees from our Child Development Center here at NASA Langley. That's a great ending uh, to that video. You can't, you can't see too much of that. Uh, but as you can see, this facility will improve the efficiency and re reliability of our number crunching. It will also give us room to grow and collaborate with our partners across the agency and with industry. As you know, at Langley, we have world-class researchers. That's been true for a century now. And researchers from across our center will benefit from this new facility. One of our areas of expertise is entry, descent, and landing, or EDL as we call it. And it's really the science of how a spacecraft enters and flies through a planet's atmosphere and lands safely on its surface. Langley's skill in this area has been used for every successful robotic mission that's landed on Mars. And as we are called upon to support NASA's journey to Mars, the calculations we need to get us there will take place in this new building. Improving our aerodynamic testing capabilities using computer models, also known as computational fluid dynamics, is another area where these powerful computer servers will help us lead the way for NASA. And in materials research, an area I used to work many, many years ago, uh, there's potential to model the property of new polymers and learn which ones will help us create stronger, lighter, more capable aircraft and spacecraft. All very exciting stuff, uh, but no matter but no matter how mighty your computers are, at the end of the day, it takes the people to use those computers and the, the innovation and brilliant ideas they come up with. And what we're really doing is taking lessons learned when Katherine Johnson and her fellow human computers calculated spacecraft trajectories with paper, pencil, and adding machines and applying them to today's missions. With this new facility, we will continue to advance the same techniques that she used to such spectacular effect and I can't imagine a better tribute to Mrs. Johnson's character and accomplishments than this building that will bear her name. 
So this, yes, that deserves a round of applause. I agree. I agree. And so this really is a day of celebration for our center and really all of NASA. And I want to send, I wanted to say again, thank you, Catherine, and all of your family for being here today. We're glad uh, you could be here to share in this moment. And we're happy all of you could join us for such a great day. You know, this is an incredible project. Wouldn't have been possible without the hard work, collaboration, and support from our partners and friends outside of NASA as well. And we're going to hear from a few of them uh, today. So first, I'd like to invite Colonel Jason Kelly of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to the podium. Colonel Kelly, can you come up? To Governor McAuliffe, Senator Warner, Representative Taylor, Mayor Tuck, Ms. Shetterly, friends of this storied installation and organization, and of course, Ms. Johnson and the family. Thank you for joining us today on this very special afternoon, on this very special day. As I look out, I see friends, I see partners, I see folks that understand the importance of collaboration, working together, especially when you're solving big problems, when taking on addressing and conquering substantive challenges. Such things are not done alone. The preciseness required to construct a computational research facility under the watchful eye of scientists and fellow engineers from which the occupants will explore and expand the frontiers of knowledge regarding space is not easily done. But I've been confident throughout. I knew this very moment, this ceremony, this very day would soon come. Ms. Kellerman, the Center Operations Director, and I have long talked about it. Exact is the demand she impressed upon me and all involved in the oversight of construction of this building. Having earned an undergraduate degree in mathematics from the United States Military Academy, followed by studies in statistics at the Georgia Institute of Technology, I feel uniquely qualified to speak on precision. <laughs> it, it's a hallmark of the Army Corps of Engineers and it underpins all that NASA has done and continues to do for our great nation. I'm honored to represent the many men and women, laborers, helpers, project managers, construction representatives, architects, engineers, and a host of support staff members who work so hard to deliver this facility. As the conclusion of my command tenure draws near, I look forward to watching from afar the great advancements and wonders that will soon be realized from this very site. I'm honored to have been a part of it and I can't see, wait to see the great work that I know will be produced from this computational research facility. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Kelly, for those uh, great remarks. Now it's my pleasure to introduce a good friend of NASA Langley, the mayor of the great city of Hampton, the Honorable Donnie Tuck. Mr. Mayor, come on up. Good afternoon to Governor McAuliffe, to Senator Warner, to Congressman Taylor, to other elected officials and government officials, to Director Bowles and to the administrators, staff, researchers here at NASA Langley Research Center and to the representatives from NASA headquarters and the other research centers, to Mrs. Katherine Johnson, to her family members and friends, to other distinguished guests. Good afternoon, it's my pleasure to welcome you here. In our city's 407 year history, as well as 100 year of relationship with NASA Langley Research Center, we've had many, many historic events, 
and many proud moments. And certainly today's prestigious recognition of Mrs. Johnson, whose contributions to NASA Langley Research Center and quiet strength have inspired so many young men and women to break through barriers, rates as the proudest moment that I've been a part of. So today, congratulations to you and thank you, as well as to the incredible men and women here at NASA Langley Research Center who will follow in her footsteps. Thank you. Let's welcome back to the center a distinguished member of NASA Langley's extended family, Margo Lee Shetterly. Thank you, Dave, and to all of our distinguished guests, to everyone in the NASA Langley family, and most of all, to Mrs. Katherine Johnson. It is an honor to be here today. In 1962, following the success of John Glenn's orbital space flight, the city of Hampton hosted a parade for the Mercury 7 astronauts. The astronauts and their families, local politicians, NASA executives, everybody toured through the city in a motorcade of 33 convertibles, and throngs of people came out to celebrate them. Now, as the public faces of the space program, those men became heroes, and their names were synonymous with American ingenuity, perseverance, and courage. Who among the 30,000 people who crowded the streets of Hampton, my hometown, I may add, that day to catch a glimpse of those Mercury 7 astronauts could have guessed that 55 years later, we would be convening to dedicate this state-of-the-art data facility to the woman whose mathematical acuity and behind-the-scenes calculations contributed to the success of so many of those groundbreaking missions. But let's not forget the motto of the city of Hampton is E Praetoritis Futura, Futura, out of the past, the future. The question, as always, has been which past and to what future? But today, as we dedicate the Katherine G. Johnson Computational Facility, we take the time to celebrate Mrs. Johnson's past, her contributions to the success of NASA, to computer science, and to our nation's space program. Since the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics set up shop here in Hampton in 1917, 100 years ago, the Langley Research Center, which was originally called the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory, has been reaching for the heavens. Catherine's work and that of the other women mathematicians who worked here with her is the foundation of this building. We are living in a present that they willed into existence with their pencils, their slide rules, their mechanical calculating machines, and of course, their brilliant minds. With Katherine Johnson's achievements to inspire us, we are called first to imagine and then to engineer the future of NASA, of our community, and of our country. From the vantage point of the present, it's really easy for us to look at the past and to assume that what actually happened was always inevitable. It seems like a foregone conclusion, for example, that America would triumph over the Russians in the space race. Only when we step into our time machine and examine the past up close do we understand that the path to the future is rarely smooth or direct or predictable. And Catherine's story is no exception, but at every fork, her talent, her hard work, and her character pulled her toward her destiny. At every turn, she made a choice becoming the protagonist of her own story and then of ours. Her work calculating the trajectory for John Glenn's 1962 orbital flight is only the most well-known episode in a life that intersected many of the memorable events of the 20th century. But it's an anecdote from her youth, one that took place decades before those decisive weeks in 1962 that I think is particularly relevant to this occasion because it paved the way for us to be here today. Katherine Johnson graduated from high school and enrolled in the historically black college, West Virginia State Institute, at age 14. And in no time, she had whipped through all of the courses in the math department. Now, a professor named W. W. Shefflin Clater, he was the third African American in the country to get a PhD in mathematics, and he was born in Norfolk. Dr. Clater took note of Katherine's talent, and he developed advanced math classes just for her. 
And in fact, he did more than that. What he did was he began to prepare her for a career as a research mathematician, which for any woman in the 1930s, much less a black woman, was essentially non-existent. Where will I find a job, she asked him. And he said, well, that's your problem. <laughs> now, I've come to think of Shefflin Clater as the ghost of NASA future. Somehow, he believed that his star student would eventually find a career that was worthy of her talents, and he did all he could to set the cornerstone of that career. And the fact that a professional mathematician's job was nowhere on the horizon when Katherine Johnson was in college did nothing to dull her enthusiasm for that work. When she finally made it to NASA in 1953, this was 16 years after graduation, many of those years spent working as a math teacher in segregated Virginia schools, she was well prepared for the job. And she was so well prepared, in fact, that Dorothy Vaughn, who was the head of Langley's All Black West Area Computing U Unit, selected her for the assignment in the Flight Research Division. And I just want to mention that Dorothy Vaughn actually taught at Moton High School, this was the, or this is the black school in Farmville, Virginia, uh, where Barbara Johns went to school. So there are a lot of connections here. Now, Dorothy Vaughn herself was a brilliant mathematician, and she was also an excellent manager. So Dorothy knew that when she sent Katherine Johnson to this hard-charging group of brainy fellas, that she was sending the smart one. This is, as the John Glenn character mentions in the Hidden Figures movie. Katherine Johnson was the right person at the right time for the job at hand. And it was the rigorous preparation from her days as a student that would set the trajectory that would bring her here to NASA, where she could play a role in determining the future. So any of you students out there who have ever been in math class and have asked your teacher, when am I ever going to use this? <laughs> I think this might be a really good time for you to have a sit down with Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> so by now, most of us know the details of the work that Katherine Johnson did here at NASA. We know about the calculations she provided for Alan Shepard's flight, the calculations that she provided for John Glenn's pioneering orbital flight, we know about the math that she contributed to the parking orbit cap calculations for the Apollo 11 mission to the moon. Today, all of those things seem inevitable, but without her past full of diverging roads and choices that made all the difference, we would not be standing on the brink of this future. My first interview with Katherine Johnson took place in 2010, and no matter how many times I've heard her story since then, I am always blown away and very touched. But what she did in that interview and over the course of many more interviews was to tell me the stories of other women. She told me about her admiration for Mary Jackson, who became NASA's first black female engineer. She told me that she considered Dorothy Vaughn to be one of the smartest people that she has ever met. And she told me that when she speaks to students in classrooms, and she has always been working to inspire kids to choose STEM careers, that she never fails to mention Dr. Christine Darden, who started in the computing pool at Langley in 1967 and went to, on to become a top expert on the phenomena of so sonic booms, and she is here today. She told me about Marge Hanna, the white woman who was the first supervisor of the segregated West Area group. And Marge eventually joined Catherine's group and did forward-thinking research into missions to Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And this was back in the late 60s and early 70s. So by telling her own story, Catherine Johnson put me onto the story of the black women in the West Area Computing Group. She led me to the white women of the East Area Computing Group as well, and in fact, when we celebrate her, we celebrate the women who worked as computers, mathematicians, technicians, scientists, and engineers at all of the NACA and NASA installations over the years. Her story is a story of curiosity and the thirst for knowledge that is at the core of this agency. My curiosity about Catherine's story planted the seed for Hidden Figures, and what I've come to believe after years of research is that the world that took shape over the course of the 20th century, which many of us call the American century, this world of airplanes, of spaceships, missiles, computers, communications technology, 
That world is in many ways the history of women sitting in rooms like the ones here at Langley doing math. And with all of those shoulders to stand on, there is no telling what we will be able to achieve in the future. So Catherine, telling your story has been an honor. Your work changed our history, and your history has changed our future. So thank you, happy belated birthday, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margo, for those words. And I, I'll just share, Margo and I were talking in the facility uh, before the uh, celebration. And it's just amazing that uh, we're here during our centennial year uh, and, and today celebrating uh, the opening uh, of this building uh, with somebody who had such an impact on our first 100 years. And this new facility is really going to lay the groundwork for our second 100 years. So it's just as I tell people all the time, you can't make this stuff up. It all came together in the same year, but it's just an amazing story. And uh, that's a good lead in to share a special video message from our guest of honor today. So let's show that video. My honest dance, I think the greatest. <laughs> I was excited for something new. Always like something new. But give us credit to everybody who helped. I didn't do anything alone, but try to go to the root of the question. And uh, succeeded there. Do your best, but like it. Like what you do, and you, then you will do your best. If you don't like it, shame on you. Well, now, if they just did the hard work that I did, which was my job, I did it every day. I never missed a day. Never stayed home playing stick and stuff. But my problem was to answer questions. And I did that to the best of my ability at all times, correct or incorrect. But that's my theory. Do your best all the time. I'll be exceedingly honored and greatly honored. But you know, math is the same. I gave you that answer last year, it's the same now. Today. But I, the main thing is I liked what I was doing. I liked work. I liked the stars and the stories we were telling. And it was a joy to contribute to the literature that was going to be coming out. But little did I think it would go this far. Yes, that was, that was just fantastic. Thank you, Catherine, for everything you've done uh, to, like I said, shape that first hundred years and lay the foundation for the second hundred years. Just amazing. They actually asked me if I wanted to see that video yesterday. And I told them no, I didn't. I wanted to see it real time today, and it certainly didn't disappoint. It was, it was amazing. Just, just fantastic. Blew me away. All right, so I also want to thank everyone who's helped to make this day a, a really a reality. Our partners at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Norfolk District, everyone at Turner Construction, 
And our team here, including our Center Operations Directorate and the Office of Chief Information Officer. So it's a beautiful building, and I know it, and uh, that, and the people who work in it will help us reach new heights and reveal the unknown for the benefit of humankind. That's what NASA does. Pretty cool job. <laughs> As I say, I've got the coolest job on the planet. Uh, so with that, it's really time to get down to business and officially open our new building. So I'd like to ask today's speakers to join me for the ceremonial ribbon cutting over here to the right. So, Ms. Johnson, if you can move over there. Also, I'd like to ask Loretta Kellerman, Director of our Center Operations Directorate, to join us over there as well. Her team and the great work, uh, we wouldn't be here having this ribbon cutting today without her team. So let's all go over there. Four, three, two, one. 